the next trend that I want to talk about to a very great extent is from consumption to creation. And there's really two components of this. Consumption library, to me, is the library that sort of sits back and waits for people to come inside of its doors, to discover what they have, to take it home, to consume it in the privacy of their own home, to consume it one at a time as individuals. Whereas the creation library is the library that sort of embraces that idea of, of imagination and begins to redesign even its physical space in terms of creation. This picture, by the way, I took it a year ago. Uh, the fellow that's at the front of the picture, some people would recognize him, certainly Mimi Sawood would recognize him. She worked very closely with him. Uh, the fellow playing the guitar is David Premi, who was the architect that redid our central library in Hamilton. And uh, he was with us when we went to, um, to Denmark and to other Scandinavian countries. The woman in red is actually Danish. And this was a wide area in a corridor in the Copenhagen Central Library that they had the graphic that you can see on the wall in terms of the instru instrumental zone with a number of instruments that were just lying there. And of course, nobody else could hear them unless you put your headphones on. But you could toggle switches so that you would play together. And so David, who's a very good guitar player, picked up the guitar and started to play. The woman that was playing the uh, piano, who's Danish, turned to David because she could tell that he seemed to know what he was doing. And she toggled the switch so she could listen to him. And then she asked him if they wanted to play together. They decided what it is that they wanted to play. And then they started playing together when they were dealing with it. This was not something that had to be booked for an hour or booked ahead of time. They were just lying there for people to use when they came inside the library. And as an example of a very simple uh, from consumption to creation, what we saw in a lot of the Scandinavian libraries was video editing, music editing, uh, places where the staff knew how to use these particular facilities and it appealed to younger people. And in fact, we're beginning to see some of those in North America. Uh, the, um, the central branch of the, of the uh, District of Columbia Library has a recording studio that is used by teens quite a bit. And there's some research that supports some of this. MacArthur Foundation, which is uh, based in, uh, in, in Chicago, has uh, produced an entire book of research that's about 30 different studies. And in fact, I, I have cited the book that is available free as an online download, and you can get hold of it. So it's in the report, and it will tell you how to get hold of it. And what the research actually concluded is that what teens wanted when they were learning and when they were excited about learning is they wanted to do three things. They wanted to hang out, and hang out was really defined as they wanted to talk to each other informally, and they wanted to be in a relaxed situation. They wanted to be able to put their feet up, and they didn't want anybody to put their, tell them to put their feet back down again. They wanted to mess around. They wanted to experiment with new technologies that they didn't have access to when they were at home, and they wanted to geek out. And uh, these are terms the MacArthur Foundation uses. I'm not sure I absolutely love the terms, but when, by geek out, what they actually meant is, is that I know the cheats to this particular video game, and because we're all here together, I'll tell you how the cheats work, and we'll share information, and by the way, uh, you're trying to figure out how to move a domain from, map a domain from here over to this site, because you're forming a company with your own website. Here, let me show you how to do that, because I know how to do that, so you're sharing that information. So what Chicago Public Library did is it took these three principles that were done by research, and they took about 10,000 square feet in the central library, and they zoned it in three different zones. And they made one of them is the hangout zone, one of them is the geek out zone, and one of them is the mess around zone, and even identified them with sort of differentiations in floor coloring and the way that they were done. And they said, we're gonna set these areas up according to the research and see if it actually is something that teenagers and young adults would respond to. Well, I was there the day it opened. And uh, when it opened, I looked at it, and I, frankly, I thought, this isn't going to work. You know, this is not going to work at all. I was there a year later because my son loves architecture, and we were looking at architecture in Chicago. And I snuck out one morning to go down to the central branch of Chicago Public Library so that I could see this thing. I imagined it being boarded up or being used as a reading room or in some other way. And I was shocked to discover that absolutely each and every one of those spaces was being used exactly as designed. And that the research was dead on perfect in terms of the ways in which people wanted to use the space. Now, you media spaces since that time have sort of taken off and are being used in the United States. There's one in Miami, there's one in Los Angeles. There are a number of them in, in a lot of the larger cities in the United States. Um, I want to talk a little bit about maker spaces. Uh, maker spaces, I'm very high on maker spaces. I think that they are something that is incredibly exciting. 
And it's interesting that they're, by last count, about 166 is what I heard uh, just a few minutes ago, maker spaces uh, throughout the world. And if you don't want to know what a maker space is, and I'm sure many of you do, and here's a picture of a simple one from Detroit Public Library where it really is space inside the middle of the library itself. Some of them are quite small. Uh, the one in the Fayetteville, New York is probably no more than 2,000 square feet at most, uh, probably considerably smaller than that. And what a makerspace really is, is it's a space that uses technology for three, 3D uh, creation. So in the, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see with that box type of a structure, that's a maker bot made in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York. They cost about $1,200, and what they can actually do is take CAD designs from off the internet, or you can create your own designs, and using sort of the same plastic that you use in a weed whacker, it will make that 3D object from that CAD design and come up with the 3D object that you could use. Some of the more expensive uh, 3D uh, printers, uh, which is what they call them, um, actually can be used to uh, use with metal, you can use them with glass, you can use them with plastic, and you can make uh, very complicated objects that are out of them. In fact, just last week, because I read TechNews every day, uh, what I was actually reading about is a, a combination of 3D printers and some other technology that they're beginning to use with non-invasive knee replacement surgery, um, where it can actually shoot material into the knee and then solidify and begin to replace some of that particular item. Now, there, there is a number of books, including one by Chris Anderson that just came out this fall, Makers, The New Industrial Revolution that talks about his belief, which is that instead of seeing mass manufacturing where material is being sh shipped in with great shipping costs from China and from Mexico and other places, where you're going to see many manufacturing locations that are going to be set out that may make razors in the morning and may make something else in the afternoon because the maker technologies, the robotics and the maker technologies, can be easily reprogrammed to make smaller runs of, of different types of items. There's a point here, which is that it feels to me, when I talk about maker spaces and think about them, that we're way back to the early 1980s and the early stages of the PC and the home brew clubs, where libraries were sort of making computers available to people that could not afford to have them in their homes. And at that time, they were about $4,000 for a lot of the PCs. Lots of people couldn't afford to have them in their homes. The libraries and the first public access <coughs> computer labs became places that people could experiment places that people could turn to and use that type of technology. And there are a number of stories of people who have gone and started to use the maker spaces and the robotics that are available and the laser cutters that are available and the 3D printers that are available there in order to spin off and make their own company. But certainly to use technology that they could not afford to use in their own homes. So just the same as some libraries are using things like music editing labs and are using video editing labs, then makerspaces are another component of it, where what you're allowing people to do is to exercise their imagination, where it's almost like the thing, same thing as social networking, where we didn't expect people to want to contribute. But at the same time, what we're also seeing from that creative world, that we didn't expect somehow that people wanted to contribute in quite the same way. And makerspaces are something that allow people that are young people, middle-aged people, to use a technology that is not often available. One thing that I might mention that's interesting about makerspaces, because they're not very expensive to actually buy the technology that is associated with it, although too much for an individual family, is that many of the makerspaces in North America do not exist in large communities. They're in smaller communities. Uh, the one in Fayetteville, New York, Fayetteville has a population of maybe 20,000 people. Uh, the only one that I know of that exists in Canada at the present time is in the Innisfil Public Library with 30,000 people that's about an hour north of Toronto. So they're not in large cities. Um, and as part of another project that I've been doing, we've been doing a study of what public libraries are intending to do over the next few years in terms of technology. And what we saw from that is that in large libraries, none of them had done creation spaces in the last five years, but 10 or 11 or 12 of them are intending to do it in the next five years. So it is something that is coming and it's coming quite rapidly.